About 10 years ago, actually almost exactly 10 years ago, um, was, of course, Doug's 60th birthday conference. And there I heard about the BP Mafia and um, big orange heads and Doug's work. And I never dreamed when I was there that I would be um, pulled into Doug's orbit and this real world. So um, it's really exciting for me to be standing here and talking about Doug's work in the last decade, um, all of which I have at least passing familiarity with. Um, so, so I want at some point today to talk a little bit about the Carver invariant one problem stuff. But I think all of you have seen me speak about the Carver invariant one stuff. And all of you have seen Doug talk about the Carver invariant one stuff. And you've all seen Mike talk about the Carver invariant one stuff. So I'm going to focus on some lesser known work, um, mainly because we never wrote it up. Um, but, uh, but I want to talk about the, the work that preceded this and ended up being completely eclipsed by the Carver invariant one stuff with uh, almost complete totality. So this, uh, thus endeth my jokes for the day. Um, so <laughs> anything else is just from my natural inadvertent humor. Um, so I want to talk about a theorem about the action of finite subgroups on the Morava stabilizer. Uh, excuse me, on the Lubin Tate deformation space, and how you can use this to compute the homotopy groups of the Hopkins Miller higher real K theory spectra. And so you'll see, um, as I talk about this, how it ended up influencing a lot of the, the work related to the Carver invariant one problem. And um, another thing that's a little surprising is I gave um, a, a series of talks very similar to this about. Um, seven years ago, which gives a timetable for how this all unfolded, maybe eight. Um, and Vesna set the stage beautifully for me. So there's a lot of background that I'm able now to skip because she talked about it. But I'm going to start with the Hopkins-Miller theorem. And I'll paraphrase it. And that is that the, the Lubin-Tate spectra En have an essentially unique E infinity structure. And the Morava stabilizer group acts via the infinity ring map. And then, I don't remember if I'm using the same notation that Vesna used. Um, so here, this is going to be the semi-direct product of the automorphism group, so the maybe the smaller Morava stabilizer group, the automorphism group of a height n formal group, I'll say the Honda formal group, over fp to the n. And then I can extend this via the Galois group. And then making good on, on a program established by Jack Morava, Mike and Ethan showed that the map from the KN local sphere to the homotopy fixed points of EN under the action of this group 
is an equivalent. And so since this is the homotopy fixed points, of course, we have a spectral sequence then that computes this that starts with the continuous cohomology of this profinite group with coefficients in the homotopy group of En and that converges to the homotopy group of the KN local sphere. Now, um, I don't really need to say a lot about why this part still is a little bit tricky, uh, perhaps to this audience. I need to know a lot about this. The parts that I do know some about are this. Again, Vesna reminded us yesterday that the homotopy groups of En are, um, are, are fairly simple. I have the Witt vectors of Fp to the n. And then I join to this a series of parachute generators. And then I have an invertible class. And all of these are in degree zero, and then these are in degree plus or minus two. The whole thing is two periodic. And then um, for convenience, I may sometimes also really abusively write this as uh, zp to the n, um, because if n is one, then this is the p attic. And have limited creativity. So the problem is understanding this group action on the ring representing this universal deformation. And again, we have a theorem of, of Mike and Ethan, which tells us a lot about this. Let's see, I want to think how much detail I want to go into. Maybe I won't go into too much. And that is that there's a filtration of this. There's an equivariant filtration. Of En star. Such that the associated graded. looks like a symmetric algebra on a particular representation, let's call M, and then I uh, invert a class, and I complete with respect to some idea. They actually show um, a much stronger result, and much more they give recursive formulas that tell you how to compute the action of any element in the Morava stabilizer group on En star. So I'm using this in the most simple way possible, in that I'm just sort of basically carving out the, the very bottom piece of those formulas to say that, that this, the associated graded as an equivariant thing, has this really nice form, this symmetric algebra on, on um, M, and here M is, again, the Dudenay module that uh, Vesna talked about. So um, Vesna also told us, yeah, Vesna also told us about the, the higher real K-theories, the EOMs, and the roles that they've played. So I'll put in a little bit of notation that might deviate slightly from hers. So I'm going to say that EON G is going to be the homotopy fixed point of G acting on En, where here G is finite.
inside. And then I could do, I guess I'll do all the edges. And as Vesna told us yesterday, these serve as sort of a, a finite approximation to the cohomology of the former of a stabilizer group. That the idea is I can build the K and local sphere um, in, a, in a finite way out of these building blocks. And when I think about, um, about this group, well, this has finite virtual cohomologic dimensions. In other words, it has some big subgroup sitting inside it, which has finite cohomological dimension. And so then the rest of it's given by, by the cohomology of finite group pieces. So in some sense, these finite subgroups are controlling for me the very large behavior of the cohomology, where by large, I mean large in this degree. When I get very high up cohomologically, in some sense, the finite subgroups are controlling all of that, because everything else is governed by this, um, this subgroup of finite cohomological dimension. So you can think of these as being good asymptotic approximations. And then Vesna also told us about the bottom examples and described a lot about the duality things. I'm going to start to deviate from that now. So the, the question that shows up at this point, or at least it showed up for me, and I guess it showed up for lots of other people, is what are the possible finite subgroups here? And so then here's the result of Hewitt. that if I only care about those sitting inside the Morava stabilizer group, then there are two forms. The first is, oh, I need to be a little more specific. I'm going to write n as p to the k minus 1 times p minus 1 times m, where P and M are relatively prime. Then the finite subgroups are all of the form a uh, cyclic group of P power order and then extended by some other cyclic group. Where here um, 0 is less than or equal to R is less than or equal to K and L is prime to P. And then if P is 2, then there's an extra case. I also have the binary tetrahedral group, which is the extension of the quaternions by C3, where C3 acts by permuting I, J, and K. And so I don't need to say, I don't need to spell out exactly what this is. The action of this on this is, is one you'd probably guess here, thought about these meta abelian groups. But I do want to say a tiny bit about where these are coming from, because I find it helpful in thinking about where they're coming from to get another way to think about how I might have predicted the action of these on, on the module M. Right. So Vesna showed us that I can think of this group Fn as the group of units in a ring O n, which was this um, ring of bit vectors, and then I joined a non-commuting variable f. F the n with p, and the commutation relation involving the Frobenius. Now, the I'm calling this O n because if I pass to the Q 
skew field of fractions, so this fits inside a ring Bn. This is a central simple algebra. QP algebra. And central simple QP algebra, so these are elements of the Brouwer group of QP. The Brouwer group of QP is given by Q mod Z. And so you just have to tell me uh, a rational number mod Z, and it's the central simple algebra um, corresponding to 1 over n in Q mod Z. And the thing that's really nice about these central simple algebras over a p-adic field like QP is that it has dimension n squared. And then I have the following, um, I guess, number theory proposition. I'm not going to prove. And that is that if, if f is a field extension of QP of degree dividing n, then F sits inside D. So I can think of this big division algebra as being built out of all of these out of these actual field extensions of QP. And then this, this ON, it's actually the maximal order. So I'm in QP. I have a valuation on everything. The valuation on S I can predict from the fact that I know the valuation on P. It's a P-adic thing. And then the valuations are multiplicative. So this gives me the, the valuation on all of D. And surprise, the valuation on S is 1 over n. There's a lot of consistency here. So this is determined by the evaluation and the field. Oh, excuse me, and, and then dn. So I should think of this as saying, I have this object. This is the fundamental one. Out of this, I get a maximal order. And this is a presentation of that maximal order, where I've written it relative to a preferred field extension of QP. My preferred field extension of QP is a join, in an unramified way, roots of unity. In this case, I'm adjoining a p to the n minus first root of unity. That's an extension that, has, um, that ends up being essentially this size, which divides n, because it is n. And then I put in my other basis vectors. The roots of unity sitting inside here, in this case, the, the p to the n minus first roots of unity, that gives me the maximal finite subgroup when r is 0 here, so the maximal prime to p finite subgroup. But the p minus 1 and the condition on why I get p to the k when p to the k minus 1 was the biggest thing that divided is just that if I take ramified extensions, QP extensions. So in particular, I'm going to take QP, and I'm going to join to it various P to the rth roots of unity. Then I can ask, what's the degree of this over QP? And I see that this is P to the r minus 1 times p minus 1. The p minus 1 is just from thinking of what happens when r is 1. And I factor my cyclotomic polynomial. That's this. So I can choose a different way to describe O n cross. O n cross is the, is the um, units in this maximal order. I can choose a different way to write down my maximal order, and that gives me a different way that I can think about this. Think of it as I'm choosing a different basis, but everything in sight's equivariant, because I'm just describing the action of the units in a ring on the ring, and then I'm choosing a way to write down that ring. So from this perspective, 
if I write it in terms of not the standard um, bit basis, but say this ramified basis, then I've described it as I have an action of the pth roots of unity on some sum of copies of this extension with the pth roots of unity. Okay. In fact, all of the abelian subgroups that I've written down work this way. You can always think of them as take a maximal extension where I've put in as many roots of unity as possible. And the uh, trick is I can, um, I can actually put in more roots of unity than I necessarily expect, but I can't do so in an abelian way. And that's where I get the semi-direct plot. OK. So. All right. Maybe now what we were thinking about and why we started thinking here. So to compute pi star of E O N G, I need uh, two pieces of data. So I have a spectral sequence that starts with the cohomology of G acting on pi star of En. So that's my homotopy fixed point spectral sequence. And if I still have it, yeah. So when I look at what the groups are, um, let's ignore this case for now. So if I look at the groups here, then of course I have two pieces. I have the part at P, everything's P complete, and then I have the prime to P part. The cohomology of a group with coefficients in something in which the order of the group is inverted is boring. It's only in H0. Now, um, that statement's about to come around and bite me pretty hard, because it actually says I'm looking at the invariance of the action of a finite group on some ring. This is a surprisingly hard problem. Um, but let's pretend that it's easy. And then I have to ask, what's the cohomology of a cyclic P group? with coefficients in some module. This is like the best of all possible setups. I mean, the very first group cohomology computation we learn how to do is the cohomology of a cyclic P group. And then we wave our hands and pretend that all groups behave like cyclic P groups. And when they don't, we take our toys and go home and reduce to the case that we have a cyclic P group. So this should be a really simple computation. Namely, I'm looking at the cohomology of a cyclic P group on something. So the, um, the, the way I'm casting my voice and the way I'm building dramatic tension should lead you to believe that, in fact, it's not as simple as we might have liked. And the problem is I don't have a perfect description of the action of this group on this ring. I described for you that there are recursive formulas that tell me the action of this, but then I need to know a lot of information that I have to be able to solve. And I know this up to associated graded. So from that perspective, I also have a spectral sequence that starts with the cohomology. Then there's the second part. So here, I needed the action of G on N. And then there's this part. I've just described the E2 term of a spectral sequence. Um, we know, I think it's safe to say, that in general, knowing the E2 term of the spectral sequence isn't enough to deduce the, the, um, the E infinity term and the thing to which it abuts. Um, if this were being recorded, I'd make some joke about how in algebraic geometry, we often like to have spectral sequences that collapse with no extensions. Um, since this is being recorded, I won't. And instead, I'll say, we need to figure out what are the differentials and what are the extensions. And so with this preamble, I'll state um, 
I'll state the theorem that uh, we, at some point, will write out. That is that we can answer both of these in this case. So the first. And that is, um, we have um, a G equivariant lift of that same M as before to pi minus 2 of En, which induces an isomorphism from the symmetric algebra on M with a class inverted, completed at some ideal, to pi star of En. And this is G equivariant. So this gives us the answer to what's that first part. I need the action. This is telling it to me. I have this symmetric algebra. Now, when I'm looking at at the p primary finite subgroups. Well, this is why I spent a little time here. For the p primary finite subgroups, this m is pretty simple. So p is c to the pr, and m looks like, well, so I have it on this board. This is an extension. And so I just put in a bunch of copies of the roots of unity acting on the extension field given by adjoining those roots of unity. And so n splits as a direct sum. Oh, man, I'm going to have to remember how many sum ends. of representations of the form I take the p-adic. And I'm going to adjoin to this a p to the r root of unity. And this is an extension of degree, or this is a, a free module of rank p to the r minus 1 times p minus 1. So L must be um, p to the k minus r times m, if you remembered over there, my k, r, and m. But it doesn't matter. What matters for me is that equivariantly, this is actually induced. So as a cp to the r module, this is, I induce up from cp to cp to the r, the module that's the regular representation of CP. And then I kill the trivial sum end sitting inside it. So I'll call this rep. Oh, and um, these are, of course, P's. I'm going to call this row bar uh, because that's the only thing I would ever call it. So M splits as a sum of these induced representations. So if I want to understand a map from M into this, I reduce to the case of understanding what's happening CP equivariantly for our general CP to the R. And so I want to spend a little bit of time talking about that case because um, I'm hoping that it will provide a little bit of um, leisure demand to let me avoid talking about the cohomology of Cp to the r for r bigger than 1 on, a, on something that's like a polynomial ring on which the group acts by permuting the coordinates. Turns out every part of that problem is actually frustratingly hard. Because you immediately run into the problem of compute the ring of invariance of Cp acting on p minus 1 generators where it permutes them up to a sign. If you're lucky, like say you're looking at two generators and p is three, then you actually know that you're looking at the cohomology of the alternating group. And you can look up tables that people computed for you, the cohomology of the alternating group. 
The moment p is 5 or beyond, then you find that these are problems that uh, people who do invariant theory um, tend to not look at. So it's a little ugly. So I'm going to stick with R is 1. And I get that if R is 1, then I see a bunch of copies of this reduced regular representation. And I have, um, I have n over p minus 1 copies of this. Now, I know the symmetric algebra on this. So the symmetric algebra on multiple copies of these is just the tensor algebra, or the tensor together, the symmetric algebra is on one copy of them. And the symmetric algebra on one copy of them is um, it's a little weird, but this looks like it looks like a trivial thing. They'll say, OK, no. They'll say, it's a trivial thing in dimensions congruent to uh, 0 mod p. Oh, whoops. I'll say it this way. It's a copy of rho bar in dimensions congruent to 1 mod p, and otherwise it's free. So I'm being a little glib then, because I'm not telling you what this algebra is, but from the point of view of homology, and actually from the point of view of this spectral sequence, I don't need to worry about all of these free factors. The moment I have free factors, free factors form a tensor ideal. So when I tensor these together, I'm still going to get free factors. Anything that's in a free factor, any of its group cohomology is concentrated just in dimension 0, because it's free. And I know that the fixed points, so the thing that shows up in dimension 0, is the transfer of something from the underlying. So from the point of view of this spectral sequence, I can ignore free summands. Free summands show up as permanent cycles in the spectral sequence that don't interact with the higher cohomology. So the easiest way to describe the resulting E2 term is actually to compute the Tate E2 term. Uh, so I'll use the hat for the Tate. This is the Tate cohomology. of Cp coefficients in pi star of En. And this looks like a big exterior algebra on classes alpha 1 up to alpha L. And then I have a power series ring on classes delta 1 up to delta L minus 1. Then I have um, two Laurent generators. And these all in degree 0. Beta is the generator of H upper 2 of Cp with coefficients in the p-adic. Delta is in degree 2p. And then these I'll describe in just a second. OK. So 
so I claim that if you're so inclined, you can actually compute this out of this. That I have the number of factors here. So this is my L from before. So I have, I really take the L fold tensor power of this, and then I had to do some completions and such. And so you can see that this is giving me the cohomology of the trivial sum ends. That's the plus or minus the beta to the plus or minus one, because I'm in take. Each of the alphas is giving me a copy of H1 of the corresponding reduced regular representation. And then I have the free sum ends, the ones corresponding to degree P. That's giving me each of these and this one. OK. So great. This gives me the E2 term. I would reverse engineer it uh, from the take. Basically, just read the things in dimensions. Um, zero or bigger and ignore the freeze. But I should say a little bit more about these, and I'm actually going to give them more familiar names. So this one's H10 and so on out to HL0. So here I'm blurring the Adams and Adams Novikov names. So now I also can say something about the differentials. And I want to make sure I didn't get uh, too far afield. Yeah. So the second theorem is um, first, each of these little deltas, these are all permanent cycles. And so is alpha 1. And then the second part is that um, essentially nothing else is. So everything else supports differentials and for a while. They all actually have the same form. So they start with beta, delta, actually all of the hj's. They all start with the first thing that I'm going to hit is alpha 1, beta to the p. Delta hits alpha 1, beta p minus 1. Delta, and the same thing is true for the other hi zeros. They also oops. so I see this this differential, and then there's a second round that goes in until I reach. Oh, I should have left myself more space. Delta to the P to the L is a permanent cycle. And the spectral sequence has a horizontal vanishing line. The horizontal vanishing line part actually follows from the nilpotence theorem because this element beta isn't detected in homology, in say MU homology. And so I know that it had to be no potent here. And everything in sight is, well, it's a Laurent generator. And it's basically giving me all of the higher cohomology stuff eventually. So that forces the horizontal vanishing line.
So um, it may seem like I'm woefully behind on time. Um, in fact, it was planned this way so that, unfortunately, I can't give all the details of the argument um, or even any details of the argument. Um, with a few exceptions, I want to give the key ideas that go into this so that you can um, cannot just think I'm having some sort of elaborate computational fantasy. So there are a few parts, and, and they also suggest how this sort of analysis and this kind of computation led naturally to the Kerber invariant 1 stuff. So the first is, why are these delta i's all permanent cycles? Well, the delta i's, I'll remind you where they came from. So delta i was the following. I had these classes, which I'll call capital delta i, or i, and this um, generated the p-fold symmetric power of the copy of rho bar, of the i-th copy of rho bar. So I'll just put a little i here to indicate which sum end I'm using. And so then I have the last one, the, the delta L, which is my delta. And my delta i's are the capital delta i over little delta i. Well, let's unpack this a little more. So here, when I was looking at the p-fold symmetric power, I chose some generator of this. I'll call it, um, yeah. I'll say that rho bar is generated by some class u i, although I'm going to regret this in a minute. I'm probably going to terribly regret this in a minute. Um, so it's generated by some class u i. And so that class delta i is just the product over the elements in the group of g times u i. So at this point, I'm actually making just a purely algebraic statement. I'm claiming that in the people's symmetric power of the reduced regular representation, there is an invariant element, a distinguished invariant element, and that distinguished invariant element is this product over the group. So this is the norm. And the same thing's true here. So this whole thing is actually the norm from E to CP of the class UI over UL, because this one was a unit, so it's fine. In particular, I can use the commutative ring structure and the fact that the group is acting by a commutative ring map to take my map, ui over ul, which maps the zero sphere into en. And this is a non-equivariant map. And produce out of this an equivariant map which goes from the sphere associated to the induced representation of 0 into En. But this is, again, just the 0 sphere. So I am deducing that these classes survive the homotopy fixed-point spectral sequence by actually explicitly producing the homotopy elements that they're detecting. So I have based on this construction, I have these classes, the little delta i's, essentially in a, in a God-given way. And so I don't need to worry about checking whether or not they support differentials or not. They are permanent cycles. They are explicit homotopy classes. So that was this first part. Now, for the remaining parts, there's two tricks that are closely related. So 
The first part is we can do something similar. Starting with any map from, say, an even sphere into En, call this little x. And this produces for me an equivariant map from S to K and then the regular representation into En. But of course, this isn't a sphere, and I'm looking at homotopy fixed points. So when I take homotopy, I get a map like this. This is a trick that um, that is due to Hopkins and Miller. So now I observe that the homotopy fixed point filtration on the source is the Atiyah Hirzebrook, the co-cellular filtration of the source. And the, this is some sort of uh, spanier whitehead dual of a Tom spectrum. And so it's going to be, um, I'll say the Tom spectrum of minus. 2k rho. And the co skeletal filtration of the Spanier Whitehead dual of the Tom spectrum corresponds to homotopy fixed point filtration over here. So I can use a T. Hirzebrook differentials and Mahold's work about how are cells attached in the classifying space of BCP. Well, attached, the first thing I see is primary operations, and I see MJ stuff, and everything's seen in first that Steenwood algebra. And then I deduce differentials here, because I have actual cells that are attached here mapping over into this one. So I have disks, and that produces for me explicit differentials. So that gives me, say, this one without too much work, and actually fairly universally. So I'll just draw that one very briefly. So I can start with the zero sphere mapping into En as the element 1. So this is, um, this is one of the nicest maps we could have here. So when I take the homotopy fixed points, this gives me a map from the spanier whitehead dual of BCP plus into EON for CP. And so I'll draw this, since I'm doing the dual, I'll draw it upside down, and I'll use sort of a Mahowaldian cell diagram. So I have the zero cell, that's my, viewing this as, as the base point. This goes in to EON. This goes in as one, and it's unattached. Well, that's good. We also knew that one survives the homotopy fixed point spectral sequence because this is a ring. Now, then I have the remaining cells I guess I'll do P is 3. And I have little box strands connecting the minus 1 and minus 2, minus 3 and minus 4, and then minus 5 and minus 6. And I also have a primary operation P1 that connects in the cohomology of BCP plus, the two cell to the six cell. And so when I think of what this means for my homotopy fixed point spectral sequence, well, where do all the other cells go? This one doesn't even survive to E2, but this one does. And it's a genre of, it's giving me something in, um, in H upper 2. So this goes in as my class beta. This one went in as beta squared. This one went in as beta cubed. And now when I look at this part of the diagram, I see that the class that was detecting beta 
in the homotopy fixed point spectral sequence is actually a null homotopy of alpha 1 on the class detecting beta cube. This is exactly what it means to say that two cells are connected by a P1. It means that the top one is representing a null homotopy of alpha 1 on the bottom one. So that, when I push this part of the diagram in, this cell is a null homotopy of alpha 1 on this one. That doesn't actually tell me anything about the filtration. I'm actually saying something about geometry. No matter what happens, this cell is a null homotopy of alpha 1 on this one. So when I look at what that means over here, it says that beta is a null homotopy of alpha 1 beta cubed. No homo is a null homotopy of is the same statement as there's a differential. And so I deduce that there's a differential on beta, and it hits alpha 1 beta cubed. And since p was 3, that, that's the differential that I claimed before. Now, you have to be a little careful here, and this is why I was stressing the geometry. Of course, I have a map of filtered things. So if my differentials preserve the same length, then I get everything for free. Alpha 1, in this case, is detected by something in filtration 1. So this would be an Atiyah Hirzebrook D4, um, because that's how far I was dropping. That's what I was seeing here. Alpha 1 is detected in, um, in pi star as a sphere. Over here, it's not. Over here, it's a D5. So I needed to really remember that I had this explicit null homotopy. And that gives me a way to control them. OK. So I'm going to assume that Kyle took 35 minutes to give all of his uh, announcements. I want to say a very small amount about how you would show the group action as well. This shows you how you would get the differentials in these spectral sequences once you know the E2 term. So the group action so you use Ravenel's um, method <laughs> not like I write this several times a day, um, method of infinite descent. So I have a filtration of BP with these spectra Ti. And I go out to T infinity, which is BP. And one of the nice features of these is that if I look at the BP homology of any of the TIs, uh, first, they're all A-infinity ring spectra. Um, thanks, Tyler Lawson. I know that none of these can be E-infinity with the exception of the sphere. But um, so these are, this is a nice algebra. And it actually sits inside the BP co-operations as the BP star subalgebra generated by T1 up through Ti, sitting inside. And you should actually think of these as this, this filtration of BP by these things that give me more and more Ti's. You should think of that as the filtration that Vesna was talking about when she talked about how the Morava stabilizer group has this filtration by um, smaller and smaller uh, finite index subgroups. And then that's how I'm getting the profiniteness part. These TIs, the TIs are functions on the Morava stabilizer group. And so I can think about these as when I have more and more of the TIs appearing, then I've taken the smaller and smaller subgroups that you should think of as the kernel of all of these functions. And that gives me some nice finite index thing. So because of that, 
you can see that the EONs, um, oh, sorry, that's not what I want to say. I want to say is a CP action on E T minus 1 times L smash with T L is free. And once you know this, then you descend back along this tower each time to do things that, that of course, the action of this is on this factor. And so the tail is a sort of a natural way to compute all of this. So I claim that you should believe that this is free. And you should believe that this is free, um, both from the implicit imbalance in me standing at the board and you sitting, and then also in that if I do the case that L is 1 and P is 2, then this becomes the statement that if I look at, at KU and I smash it with T of 1, and I'm at 2, then I claim that this has a free CP action. Well, why would I believe this is a free CP action? Well, T of 1 when I think of what its BP homology is, its BP homology, it has a single cell in every even dimension. And the way T of 1 starts is it's actually just a bunch of cones on eta. And then, of course, the other cells are also attached to the bottom. I'll see new, I'll see the other stuff. I'm not going to worry about that. But so this becomes something like KU smash the cone on eta, and then I've adjoined to this, so this was my T1, and then I've adjoined to it something like T1 squared. And so when I do this, this is the, the result that we are all very familiar with. That when I take KU, so Moss is theorem, that when I take, well, wood, wood's theorem. Um, when I take KU and smash it with the cone on eta, as a C2 equivariant thing, this looks like KU smash C2 plus. Is that the, pardon? Yes, so I'm, I'm, um, I'm doing the pre-homotopy fixed point version and also attributing it to wood. Um, so yes, I could have said KO smash the coronator gives me KU, and then I would have deduced that EO T minus 1 L smash TL splits as a wedge of copies of E P minus 1 L. And that would be the direct analog. But I'm saying it this way to think of it in terms of just freeness there. OK. There were a lot of pieces that went into this, as you can see. But you can also see where the, the antecedents for the covariant variant one problem work came from. Again, we were looking at something like detecting certain elements in the homotopy groups of spheres by detecting them in these higher real K theories and then trying to compute with them. And um, I had uh, a, a whole boatload of real jokes for the, the last um, few minutes. Um, but I don't think I'll use them. Um, maybe a couple. So at some point, the question arose, and I'm going to attribute it to Doug, that if I look at this at a prime p, and I'm looking at l equals 1, then I can use um, this EOP minus 1 machinery to provide another proof of Doug's result of the non-existence of the elements beta p to the i over p to the i. This was done originally by Hopkins and Miller when this machinery uh, first arose. And so that left open several cases. First, it doesn't work at um, p equals 3 
because there you're trying to look at the survival or non-survival of V2 periodic classes in a V2 periodic cohomology theory. So I can't separate them out well enough. And it doesn't work at two, uh, well, two is always weird. Um, so it leaves open the case of the survival of the beta two to the i's over two to the i's and the beta three to the i's over three to the i's. And so in the last minute, two minutes, I'll, I'll talk about those two. So the first one is one that, that I've uh, spoken about several times. This is that uh, for j at least 7, the Covert classes theta j do not exist. And the machinery that we used for this, we brought to bear this huge amount of equivariant machinery. But you can see all of the same pieces in the kinds of computations I was using. First, an essential ingredient in this is the norm functor on equivariant homotopy, a way to multiplicatively bootstrap from subgroups into the bigger group and then use that and the geometry to deduce differentials. That's what we used to get, well, a lot of the differentials that we were able to get. The other aspect is the Mackey functor structure inside here. Implicit in my discussion of you can throw out things coming from the free summands is a statement that I can throw out things coming from the free summands because the homotopy fixed point spectral sequence is really a spectral sequence of Mackey functors where I'm looking at the finite group together with all of its subgroups and that lattice. And all of that's intertwined. That information all went into looking at this. Our first hope was to do everything for E04 and to run the computation there, but um, it, it, was, it looked like it would be much too unwieldy and there was a lot that we didn't know. And so I want to uh, quickly advertise a recent result of Jeremy Hahn and Danny Shi, and that is that the, for all n, the EN has a real orientation. And so out of this, you get for any, I'll just say C2 to the R, and that acts on EN, we get a map from the norm of MUR to EN. So we'd hoped something like this would be true because that would let us deduce things for the EONs. Instead, um, we realized that we didn't need to use this. We could analyze what was happening here. And so it's, I guess, sort of a recurring theme, at least for myself in math, that you are trying to solve one problem, and we understand the homotopy of this, and you get distracted with um, a different case that it turns out you can say enough in. So this is what settled the beta two, excuse me, the beta two to the j's over two to the j. And so then the last part of what Doug's been working on, and this is where I'd end up joking about um, some sort of hyper realness, um, is what do we do for odd primes? So for p equals two, we have the fact that the complex numbers have a really nice index two subfield. Um, We'll probably, in fact, I think if you ask most people, they're more familiar with the index two subfield than the complex numbers. Um, but the, we don't have any other finite index subfields of C. So there's no geometric way that I can build something like MUR out of, out of MU. And so Doug has computed, has conjectured, A spectrum. Um, Doug, I don't know what you call it, so I'll just call it um, BP mu P. It's a CP spectrum with two properties. First, 
if I forget the group action, then this looks like the smash product of p minus 1 copies of bp. And second, if I take the CP geometric fixed points, then I get the eilenberg maclean spectrum, HFP. And so with the two of these, and this is what I'll finish with, you can play the same game. And you deduce, um, I'll call it a theorem. And that is that um, beta 3 to the j over 3 to the j does not survive. for j at least 6. And so I'll stop there. Thank you.